Cecil, how are you doing on this Wednesday morning? I'm good, Travis. How are you today? We're hanging in there, man. Just trying to sort of minute by minute at this point keep up with the fallout from the coronavirus and specifically how it's impacting the sports world uh, almost, again, momentarily, it seems like at this point. And um, I know that protocols have been shifted a little bit for the SEC men's tournament set to get underway later this evening up there at Bridgestone Arena. Um, Do do you anticipate or kind of expect that there might be some further adjustments made to how business is conducted up there? Or do you think this is what we're going to have throughout the event? Well, I think it's going to depend um, on state governments and federal government. You know, I don't know that the, the facility or that the league is going to make a unilateral decision without that um, for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, there, there are contracts in place and so forth that they don't want to necessarily cancel. And, and, um, you know, if you, if you have a state of emergency, that changes some of that from an insurance standpoint. So, you know, that's, that's one of the many, many things that go into it, but I, I don't want to sound like, you know, the SEC doesn't care or that the, the people in Nashville don't care. I think they do. And so they're, they're monitoring the situation, the situation's being, monitored in Washington, I would just encourage people to, to use their best judgment and and um, certainly take precautions if they are going to be in a large crowd. Just a wide variety of, of steps being taken dependent upon who we're kind of relative to who we're talking about. We've seen it with the Ivy League canceling outright. It's men's and women's tournaments. Um I talked about it, got a text from our daughter last night at dinner. Oh, by the way, no fans allowed into the Big West tournament at all coming up this week and this weekend out there uh, in the Anaheim area. Um, How much do you think the NCAA and its member institutions are kind of struggling with perception at this point? Because we're seeing universities essentially tell students to stay home. Uh, right. a, a, around the country, and and how do you juggle that if you're the NCAA or you know these conferences that are putting on athletic uh, events? Well, you have to you have to weigh that, and you know I don't know you know there have been some talk as far as I know Vanderbilt intends to play in Nashville even though they're not going to have school in Nashville mm-hmm. tonight. Um, so so it is a balancing act, and and every school uh, will have to make its own decision. Um, you know Alabama. I think that there's still a little bit more comfort with with outdoor events, you know, with baseball and softball this weekend, than with than with indoor. Um, but it's something that Alabama will monitor this weekend. Let's talk about Alabama basketball, the men's team heading into this tournament. Um, you've written about it this week, kind of this desert that the program has found itself in regardless of kind of regime uh, at this point for an extended period of time. Uh, Is there, with all that being said, is there a light at the end of the tunnel at some point here in the near future that you can kind of uh, envision there, Cecil, or or, where, where are things at right now? Well, I, I, I think, you know, I don't know what the future is. You know, I don't know how you define, near-term future, does that mean that they're going to win 25 games next year? Yeah, it's possible. I guess they could. But um, I think it's more important to look at what the, the – at this point, it's more important to look at the, the fact that this has been sort of a 10-year trend or 12 or 7 or whatever number you want to stick on it, but certainly 7 at a minimum. Um, and look – yeah, so that's not that's not all one group of players. That's not all one coach. And so, you know, I think institutionally Alabama needs to look at what it can do to, to support basketball. Is it doing enough? Is it is it creating a, a atmosphere that's conducive to to both winning at home and to attracting recruits? Uh, I think that all those things need to be examined and and not just 
not just say, well, you know, we went out, we spent a bunch of money, we hired Nate Oates, and now Nate Oates has to turn it around and we can forget about it. You know, that's not that's not what they did with Nick Saban. You know, obviously they went and got the, the best available guy, a guy who had won championships and, and a tremendous all-time coach, but they also gave him all the facility support he needed, all the staff support he needed, uh, anything that he needed. Uh, there was never any question, nor has there ever been any question, um, about Alabama's commitment to football and need to approach basketball the same way if you're going to field a team and not just, frankly, not just men's basketball, but women's basketball as well. They've been in a longer drought than men's basketball and, again, over several coaches. And so uh, had, a, had a little bit better year this year. I don't know that, that Sunday's going to be a great day for them, but uh, showed a little bit of improvement. But certainly institutionally, on both sides, Alabama needs to look at it. where they're playing, what they're doing, uh, what the support level is, how that compares to the support level at places that are that are successful, and make sure that they're making it possible for these coaches that they hire. And with that, you know, the expectations don't seem to to lessen any among the fan base or, and we see situations involving Nate Oates and his family like we have here in the last few days. Nate was asked about uh, apparently an interaction that that, that yeah, occurred on I, social I don't media. Know that there's any mass movement on that. I think that Nate's daughter is 15. I think she saw something and you can see a lot of stuff on social media. Uh, but I don't I had noticed any particular ground right. well you know it's just one guy who didn't know what he was talking about living in his mom's basement or wherever he is <laughs> tweeting out about the Oaks family which he shouldn't do if he doesn't have any information about what he's putting out there and probably even if he does have information it's really not his business to comment on the Oaks family yeah and i think you hit on it all it takes is one you know the, yeah. and, and and a groundswell of of thousands end up involved yeah, and, and you know, Lexi's fifteen, and and she re, she was fine. I thought her response was fine, mm-hmm. and didn't have a problem with it. But you know, they live on social media. Uh, I'm sure you know teenagers who are the same. Oh my goodness, do I ever, Cecil? <laughs> um, so let's talk about on the court and kind of expectations at this point for this Alabama team especially given the latest sort of February swoon for Alabama basketball, losers of seven of its last 11 going into this event. Um, Do we still subscribe to the theory that with this team's potential to really go off from perhaps three-point range, there's still a puncher's chance, at least in the second round game? They can beat anybody up there. They can beat Tennessee. They, they can beat Kentucky if, if things go right. But where, where the odds lessen a little bit is winning four in four days because they're just not built for that. They're just not deep enough for that. So, you know, it's, it's a situation where any any but any individual game, can they shoot well enough, play well enough? Um, you know, they've beaten the two seed. They've beaten the three seed. They've beaten the four seed. Uh, so certainly they can do that. Let's talk a little baseball here, Cecil. 16-1 and one, Brad Bohannon's team through 17 games. We all know the great measuring stick is conference play in the SEC, unlike just about any league, uh, perhaps any league in all of the sport. Uh, how much weight are we putting into that record uh, given what we know is coming up? Is, is this team really different compared to maybe some previous teams, in your opinion, Cecil, as it ventures into uh, league league play? Well, um, it, that's a hard question to answer. You know, it's, it's um, it, in some ways it's improved, in some ways not. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested specifically kind of which, which direction you're talking about. Well, just in terms of being legitimately competitive in in SEC play, 
this time around when it's it's yeah, been a little so, bit of an issue. Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, roster wide, when you look at this weekend pitching rotation, you got two freshmen yeah. who have been outstanding uh, in in non league play. You've got a lineup that I talked about from last night. You had 13 RBI last night against UAB, and 10 different players contributed to that total. I guess just roster wise, uh, depth wise. Uh, and all importantly, pitching wise, uh, have you seen enough from this team in non-conference play to think that, uh, unlike the last few years, uh, this team can be legitimately uh, competitive and not only the toughest conference in college baseball, but easily the toughest division? In yeah, I, I, I do understand where you're coming from. It, this is the toughest league, and you have to define what you mean by competitive and what your expectations are based on what for me has been a fairly limited eye test. I hadn't gotten to sit down for, for two or three solid games and take a look and analyze everybody's star because I've been doing basketball, football. Um, but looking statistically and looking at the teams they've played, the, the level of team that they've played and the pitching that they've gotten and the, the production that they've gotten in their lineup, this this looks like an SEC team, um, mm-hmm. a young SEC team, SEC team that still has some freshmen going out there. But I, I would say it's been four or five years from a talent standpoint, from a from a top of the order to the bottom of the order, from starting pitching to the bullpen, where you could say, yeah, that's a quality, that's a solid SEC team. Uh, whether that's a solid SEC team that finishes 15 and 15, 18 and 12, mm-hmm. 12 and 18, you know, now you're getting into the outcome of some one run games and some baseball. That's how competitive the SEC is. Um, I think reasonable goals for this team, from what I've seen, are make it to Hoover. Um, B500 in the league, which people say, oh, 500. That's well, baseball's different now. Nobody's nobody's going 27 and three. Not even Vanderbilt. You know the mm-hmm. national champs. Um, if you if you're 15 and 15 with the schedule Alabama has and an SEC schedule, you're in the NCAA tournament. Uh, you may not be hosting a regional. You know that might take a, a little push up to 18, 19 wins, and maybe you're hosting a regional and and 20, 21 wins, you're hosting a super. So do I think it's it's reasonable to expect them to be back in Hoover, to be in the NCAA tournament? Yeah, I think those are fair expectations this year from what I can tell from the lineup. Again, without having, you know, Brett Hudson does a great job for us, covers every game. And what he tells me and what I see in the coverage and what little I have had a chance to see, you go out to Las Vegas and win three games. That's that's a heck of an accomplishment. You know they they need to they need to start off right. They've got a home series and conference play. Missouri's been playing well, but you know need to win that series and mm-hmm. get pointed in the right direction in league play. But I would I would say it would be a disappointment um, to just be sitting at home in the point postseason again. A big disappointment. Yeah, we talked about this the other day. You would love to take at least two out of three this weekend from a postseason ineligible Missouri and then have Missouri go from that point forward yeah, you, you and beat everybody else in the league. You want to sweep them and let them win their next 27. That's exactly how you want that to work. <laughs> hey, Cecil, it's not, not going to uh, quite go that way, but if, if you get the series, and particularly if you sweep the series, um, then every game they win just helps you. Absolutely. Some good news. Speaking of Nashville and a city, as we understand it, definitely could use it um, with the events of the, the tragic tornado activity up there a couple of weeks ago and uh, now trying to host an event in the SEC tournament amidst uh, these coronavirus concerns. But uh, a Nashvillian, at least a product of Maplewood Comp- Comprehensive High School, Cecil, we learned this morning, is going to be among the 2020 inductees into the College Football Hall of Fame. That individual, of course, being the one and only EJ Jr. Great player, well deserved. Um, another one of uh, Coach Bryant's players from from the late 70s, early 80s. Um, 
went on to a to a successful pro career with the Cardinals. Um, so so it's it's a good class, and he deserves to be a part of it. Um, some some big big names in that class, um, and and it's great to see EJ be inducted with with um, Eric Dickerson, um, Glenn Dorsey, yeah, Steve McNair. Uh, guy you're very familiar with, Lomas Brown. Um, awesome. Just a you know a really tremendous class, and EJ deserves to be in with them. So so uh, that'll be that'll be great for for Alabama as those ceremonies continue, and EJ will be a fine representative. Speaking of linebackers, I'm guessing that'll be a focal point of yours when Alabama returns to the practice field on Friday to get 2020 spring drills underway between the injury updates for guys like Dylan Moses and Josh McMillan and the continued development of Shane Lee, Christian Harris. And that's before you look to the outside where you got to replace guys like Anthony Jennings and Terrell Lewis, a lot to cover there, I guess, at the linebacker level when things get underway Friday. There is. Um, I don't know how much, first of all, I would doubt you would see any real participation from, from Dylan or Josh. You know, no need to risk their rehab. Um, it'd be great to have them out there in some role and, and to know that they'll be available in the fall. But what you're looking for is the progress from the other guys, you know, the, the younger guys that, that were in the rotation last year who had their ups and downs, whether it's Shane Lee, whether it's Christian Harris, whether it's, it's Ali Keo, um, you're looking at those guys to see how they, how they come along and some of the early enrollees as well. And then, then you'll know that, that, um, if you add Dylan, if Dylan's 100% healthy to that mix, and you've added an All-American to that mix in the fall, so it, it should be it should be like every position. It, it, it's going to have a lot of interest, but it was a it was a key position last year where Alabama struggled, and so it's something that you'll really look for in the uh, in the spring practice. I guess too, such an influx of early enrollees at both outside and inside linebacker guys like Des Moines Kennedy, Jackson Bratton, I would think inside and then outside a couple of three, five stars and Chris Braswell, yeah, Will Sanders, Anderson. Yeah, I'll be interested to see yeah, exactly Drew Sanders. how they so, I'll tell you yeah, what, you watch, you watch that guy's high school tape, either side of the ball. He was fantastic. You know, pretty it, good high school it would be tough. Too, yeah. Yeah, and playing over in the in, in Texas and uh, what he was able to do with the ball in his hands on offense, it it makes it a, more than a little inviting, I would think, to to the offensive staff to maybe uh, to maybe jump on the table for for Drew Sanders. But it looks <laughs> like he's he's going to get his start on defense and uh, a, a guy that when you talk about just athletic ability and upside, he certainly is. Uh, one of those guys. How about uh, Cecil, the offensive side of the ball? Obviously, quarterback going to dominate storylines throughout the 15 practices. But um, you still got a lot of production to replace. There a lot of re- production coming back at wide receiver, and you know how things sort of shake out. You look at the offensive line. There's you know on paper you're just replacing one guy, but I guess in the process of doing that, there could be a little bit of a domino effect. Yeah, and always about chemistry. You know, it's always about chemistry on the offensive line. You, you, you would have to think that they have the requisite number of bodies in place, and they've got some talented, some talented guys. So, the blocks are there, but you, you still have to have um, chemistry as a unit to to be successful. Protect the passer, run the football. They've got the tools to do that. The, they've got the material to do that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see though, exactly where, you know, they'll, 
as always in the spring, they'll put different guys at different places. The guy will be a guard one day, he'll be a tackle one day, or a center the next day. Um, just to see, just to have that versatility, you want to have that, you want to have worked that um, in case the situation arises in the fall where a guy's not just getting thrown in, um, having to do things that, that he's not seen before. And spring's the perfect time for him to, to use Landon Dickerson at center and at guard or to use um, another guy, you know, see if Evan Neal is going to be a guard or a tackle. It's, it's time to, it's, this is the time to do those things and, you know, be able to do them for a couple of days, not, you know, and immediately everybody will ask Dick about it and immediately he'll tell everybody, hey, we're looking at a lot of stuff, which he says every single spring. I think even reverting back to the defensive side of the ball, there's the potential for that in the secondary too. Uh, I don't know if we're talking about that enough with the loss of Xavier McKinney and uh, Trayvon Diggs and not just those guys, but Shaheem Carter at the star position. Uh, Nick likes to refer to it as experimentation. And I think back there. Uh, you know, they've, they've got, I don't know that you'll see offense defense like they did with, with Trayvon Diggs early in his career, but not, you know, I think you'll definitely see. They'll try and find out who the who the jack of all trades back back there are, and who needs to be set at one position. So um, they've got some experience. They've got got a guy who I think is a potential All American um, to sort of build around. So in Sertan, so so see where they go from there. Um, you know, they, they've got some guys who look like corners, but you know you've got to have you've got to have versatile guys now. They've got to be able to, to play more than one role. Cecil, I know you're looking forward to that trip to Nashville. We'll sour it by talking about the kicking game, so uh, we'll <laughs> save that for another time and let you uh, yeah, well, kind of we'll, enjoy we'll, the start you know, of this trip. I, I think Will Reichert will be fine um, if he's healthy. Um, surely, surely he's back to a hundred percent now. And yeah, I, I still think that it's tough on somebody to be this place kicker and the punter. And so you'd like to see somebody maybe take over that, that punting spot. Um, so we'll see a lot of guys get, get work in, in the spring. And, um, but I, I think what most people look at is place kickers and I think I, I still think Will I don't know that you could have gone out and recruited a better kicker than a healthy Will Riker. It's just yeah. a matter of keeping him healthy. The silver lining is that the other team will have to kick the ball to you too, and that means Jalen <laughs> Waddle. So there is the those other punters, side of that, Cecil. The glass those, half those, full look at it. Those punters should be uh should be wary. Uh, I'll say that. Um, you, you don't you don't kick it to Jalen Waddle with impunity. Mm. I, I can't think of you know it, it's funny where everybody talks about special teams, special teams, special teams. But what a great run of punt returners going back to David Palmer, Alabama's had. I mean, it's just remarkable. When, yeah, when I mean, you have him, Arenas, Eddie Jackson, and now Jalen Waddle, and even and Marquise just, Mays. Had his moments, sure, Christian, Christian Jones, you know. Absolutely. I mean, they have had they have had weapons back there, and you know, t- I mean, I mean, top rated, number one in the nation guys. Um, yeah. And it's a, it's a great debate. People who saw Palmer will always go with Palmer, but Arenas, Kevin Jackson, or excuse me, Eddie Jackson, and now uh, and now Waddle. That's an amazing run. It's been a heck of a run, no doubt about it. Well, we're going to let you run. By the end of last year, people were scared to death of Waddle. Part they should have been. Kerfluffle at the end of the Auburn game was was Auburn just not wanting to punt to him one more time. Yeah, and he, you know, and and then even in that game, he returned a kickoff ninety eight yards for a touchdown. Yeah. So yeah, answered the hundred yard interception with a ninety eight <laughs> yard kickoff return. No doubt about it. Going to be interesting to see all the different ways uh, this staff figures out uh, ways to get him 
the football in 2000. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm more I'm more interested in some ways in in how how the receivers you know shake out in terms of slot and wide, and so mm-hmm. forth. But but he and Devonta are that, that's a really good start. And yeah, I am interested in watching Mechie and and some of the other receivers as they as they develop and see who the the next guy is it, it can't be like last year you just can't have that many you, you know they lost two first round draft choices and they aren't immediately going to put two new first round draft choices on the field but it'll be interesting they, they certainly can be effective in that area and and a lot of big play capability and oh how we'll talk about who it will be exactly who gets them the football i think we got uh I think we got some time to cover that, but uh, Bryce Young, Mac Jones, here's, Talia. Yeah, here's my one prediction. Nick Saban's not going to tell you. <laughs> He's not going to tell us Friday at about 6 o'clock, Cecil? Not going not gonna to come off the practice field and say, well, that settles that. Uh, we're good. What? Mm. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen either. <laughs> hey, Cecil, have a good trip up to Nashville. Look forward All to the right. coverage. All right. I may or may not be there Friday's 